I'm walking through the city center of Aarhus, the second largest city of Denmark with a population of 300,000. Aarhus has a large harbor, it is an economic center and it has a very large university campus, all woven into the city of Aarhus. Nobody will disagree to the statement that Aarhus is a city, but have you ever asked yourself what a city actually is? What makes a city a city? Are there universal rules that define urbanism today and in the past? In the next few minutes we will look into these questions. Cities are a relatively young phenomenon in human history. The first cities emerged in Mesopotamia in the 4th millennium BCE, followed by Egypt, Syria, Anatolia, the Indus Valley and China. Earlier, people lived either a nomadic life or settled in small villages. The latter were a new phenomenon in human history too. Living in a village required a stable food supply which presupposed the shift from hunting and gathering to agriculture and the domestication of animals. Both were invented in the Near East during what has been labelled the Neolithic Revolution approximately 12,000 years ago. The first city of the world might have been Uruk in southern Mesopotamia, modern Iraq. Archaeology has shown that Uruk differed from earlier settlements in many respects. It was extremely large with huge temples, palaces for kings and nobility with mighty fortifications. Yet excavations have shown that it was not only a political and religious center, but also an economic and cultural hub. Based on the study of Uruk and other early cities, scholars have developed general definitions of urbanism to distinguish urban societies from non-urban societies. Best known is the definition brought forward by Gordon Child. The Australian archaeologist Gordon Child studied prehistoric societies and in 1950 he published an essay about the urban revolution which included a catalogue of 10 criteria that in his view define pre-modern cities and urban societies. Size. Cities are larger than other forms of settlement. Specialization. Cities can sustain full-time craft specialists like carpenters and shoemakers. Taxation. The inhabitants have to pay some sort of levies to a ruler or a god. Monumentalization. The surplus in resources is used to build temples, palaces and public buildings. Social stratification. Resources are distributed unequally. There is a ruling class and a class of commoners. Writing. To facilitate record keeping and economic administrations, forms of writing are invented. Science. Science develops to gain knowledge to understand natural phenomena. Art. Art served as a tool to support claims of political and religious power. Trade. Cities have a wide network of trade relations and engage in long-distance trade. Identity. Political organization is based on residence, not on kinship. Gordon Child's 10-point definition has been very influ influential, but it has also raised a lot of criticism. Indeed, we must not stick to his rules too rigidly. 
Size, for example, is relative. We can find cities without monumental buildings, without writing systems and with more egalitarian forms of organization. Some criteria, however, seem to be universal. Most importantly, cities are always nodes in supply networks. In cities you have easy access to a wide range of goods and to specialized services. And cities play an important role in the social, political and religious organization of the land. The material manifestations of cities, their architecture, spatial organization and the range of objects present in the city reflect their role as economic, political and religious centers. Accordingly, we can analyze past and modern settlements just like Gordon Child did and draw conclusions about their character, their status and their role in the political life. In Aarhus, for example, the marketplace and the wide range of specialized shops in the city center symbolize the role of the city as a commercial hub. The large Christian basilica expresses the role of the city as a religious center. There are civic buildings which reflect the political function of Aarhus. Moreover, there are public baths, sport venues, theaters, cinemas and all sorts of entertainment which are typically urban. If you compare other cities, maybe the city where you live, to Aarhus, you will probably discover that the arrangement of the city and the range of buildings is quite similar. You can distinguish residential and public spaces, you can distinguish administrative and religious spaces and spaces for leisure. The same applies to ancient cities. To conclude, you should keep in mind that urbanism is a universal phenomenon which developed all over the world as a response to the formation of complex societies. There are certain criteria which allow us to distinguish cities and urban societies from other non-urban forms of settlement. This doesn't mean, however, that all cities look alike. Different cultural traditions had a deep impact on the appearance of cities as had environmental restraints. Moreover, cities developed over time. They did so in antiquity and they do so today.